Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for stopping by and welcome, if you are watching or listening to this, either on podcast or on YouTube, to the inaugural episode of the Game On Podcast. I am Jimbo of YouTube's The Jimbo Channel. That other gentleman on the other side of the camera is Tyler from Metroids Primed. And like I said, this is the Game On Podcast. And a quick rundown as far as what we're going to be covering here. Well, I mean, it's really all there in the title. Definitely video games. We're both retro collectors and modern game players, both avid fans of the video game pretty much all the way around. Uh, but we're not going to limit ourselves just to that. We're going to be doing things like television, movie, all, all things nerd culture pretty much. Like if it touches the hearts of nerds around the world, man, guys, we're two geeks at heart. Um, we're, we're That's definitely something that we're going to discuss and just hopefully you can share in our passion for these things. Tyler, how you doing today, partner? Doing good, man. Doing good. Awesome. Excited to, to get this new podcast started you and me both a little quick funny story for you guys where as far as where tyler and i came up with this this is basically just the the offspring of a conversation that he and i had when we were catching up and we both had mentioned that you know we had considered starting a podcast and the kind of mutual light bulb went off and like well why don't we just do one together and i was like well shit i you know, i guess that's what we should do you know so it's, it's better than sit here and talking you know to myself effectively to the camera it's a lot easier to talk to somebody and who better than you know a fellow member of the retro gaming community you know tyler and i have been friends for a while so i just figured yeah man let's let's get our heads together and uh and let's do this well i think uh jimbo the first thing we ought to talk about is what we've been playing lately because um we haven't actually played any games together in quite a while now so I'd it like has to, been a while. I'd like to know what uh, what you've been playing lately, buddy. Well, let's see. Um, lately, uh, I just got, and I've I played this on the the 360 version with you actually. Uh, Payday. I remember that was that was the first game you and I played together. Actually, yep. We went out and bought it. Okay, so um, a buddy of mine basically gifted me an X Bone gift card uh, because he bought the upgraded version of Payday for the Xbox One, and he he was a big fan of that. He and I played a lot together. And initially I was like, well, you know, it's like 50 bucks, you know, that's okay. It's, it's digital only. And you probably hate that as much as I do. We're, we're physical copy guys and it, it just irritates the hell out of me. But I will say this, um, they've really done their homework on, on this new kind of re-envisioned payday. Um, not just the graphics. I mean, it's not like a huge leap, but it's definitely a leap. Like it's running basically the same as i guess someone with a really hooked up you know alienware pc would have been running the original payday you know with everything you know anti-aliasing and all this shit turned on um it's it definitely looks beautiful they've added guns there's more classes to it there's more mass there's more characters instead of just the four guys there's like eight now i think um yeah so for the even though it's a second purchase you know effectively for me thank god i didn't have to pay for it <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm going to say that it was it would have been worth the upgrade. Like even if I had just paid the 50 bucks because of all the extra shit you get with it, I would say yes. If you like the series, do it. Well, I've got a question about that because um sure. well, me and you played it. Yeah. Like we had a, a really good time playing the game, but the Absolutely. one thing that kind of turned me off on Payday was that it was basically like four or five maps. Yes. And once you figure out like we always liked doing the jewelry store. That was yep. one of the ones we always, um, and I guess it was there was a bank that we did too. It's been so long since I played it, but um, yep. it was always the exact same setup. There was no uh, like random map or whatever. So basically, once you figured out the the layout of the map, you mm -hmm. know, the first time you've got it figured out. Did they switch it up like where there's at least like more? like versions of like jewelry stores, banks and all that, or is it yes. kind of the same? Okay. Oh, so they kind of addressed that, um, before this newest version of the, of the Xbox one version of the game came out, um, with a couple of add ons, uh, to the game that added some more maps They added instead of just the jewelry store, there was like a diamond store. There was a different type of bank. Uh, there was like an art heist where you had to break into an art museum and they've stepped that up even that much further on the Xbox one version where, we're going into missions and I'm playing with my buddy and he had been playing it for a few days before me and he's taking me in a shot. I'm like, I'm like, where the hell are we? Like, I, it looks so different. I was like, what the, and he's like having to explain the objectives and everything. Like there's one that's obviously inspired by breaking bad where you basically have to learn to cook meth oh, that's like, awesome. with, with your guy on the phone where he's literally Googling the ingredients about how to cook meth. <laughs> and if you get the ingredients wrong, the place basically blows up. Wow. So it's, there are some moments in that game where I swear 
it's short of a really good survival horror game, Tyler, it's 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 been some of the most intense, like you know, nail biting, white knuckle, like oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, you know, like that kind of stuff that I I think I've ever had in my entire life. I have just countless hours of fun uh, playing that. My one gripe with this would be, and I kind of understand it, but it kind of also sucks. All of my progress that I got on the Xbox 360 did not carry over. Oh, really? So I literally had to start from zero. And I was oh. like a level 70 something. So, you know, I understand that not everyone can be like Blizzard and, you know, do like the cross platform thing where they handled the Diablo 3 transition, which they handled perfectly. I mean, that was like the textbook example of how to handle a transition or to give people a reason to buy the upgraded version. Um, I wasn't really expecting that from, from these guys. So, it's okay, but there is one thing that they've added to this that I think gives people an incentive. If you keep playing the same map over and over and over again, like basically just milking the experience, your experience actually starts to degrade, meaning you don't get as much from that particular mission as you would. When you do variety, you get a lot more bonuses, and you actually level extremely fast. On our first mission, I jumped three levels Okay. in one mission. So if you, if you really know how to play the game like he and I did, excuse me, and you really know the tricks and stuff like that, even though you're kind of limited by your weapons and your equipment and stuff like that, you're going to blast right through this. Like by the end of the first night, I was like level 10. And that was with two and a half hours of playing, maybe. I mean, we were just blasting through missions. So don't, don't be discouraged just because you played it on a previous platform. If you like the Xbox 360 version, you have an X-Bone, make the jump. That's what I say. Okay. Well, I'm a, I had a buddy that was asking about um, getting it on Xbox One, and I you know, kind of discouraged him initially just because of that initial experience on the 360 but mm -hmm. you know hearing hearing all that it sounds like i need to get it too so i i would love to play with you man we'd love to have a third guy i i if you like the first one at all you will love the new one i, I can yeah i mean that. i loved it but it just got where you know we had, like once you beat the mission it was like you know what what's there to to do you know i mean i'm just playing the exact same mission over and over again but and you know we had some of those same nail biting experiences you know trying to get out without the cops getting us and hop in the van you know which is time really hard even at a higher level like getting getting through a mission without attracting any police attention that takes real skill like just beating the mission doesn't become enough like you want to be like I don't want to have any, you know, dead bodies. I want to do this totally clean and everything like that. Like I want to do zero cops because you get bonuses for that. And it's to this day, it's still really hard, even on the lower level missions to really control the room to the point where the cops aren't even called. Well, what else have you been playing lately? Um, well, I haven't played it yet, but I just got it in the mail the other day. Um, for anyone out there not in the know on this, uh, the Microsoft store has like amazing deals on things like the online store where, and I'm not talking just download codes, like physical copies of games. I probably bought five or six different games from them. Um, just on random sales. Uh, this most recent time was the new Wolfenstein. Uh, not, not the new one. That's the prequel, the one before the new order, I think it's called. Um, I haven't played it yet. Heard a lot of great things about it. I just got it in the mail yesterday, so it's sitting downstairs next to the Expo and ready to go. But everyone I know that's played it is like, dude, if you love Wolfenstein, this is going to be, this is the Wolfenstein that you remember. So I'm looking forward to checking that out. But anyways, I've been blabbing on here, man. Tell us, what have you been playing? Um, you know, I went on vacation. That, that's what causes us to delay the podcast for about a week yeah. or so. But um, I took my handhelds with me. Um, that's primarily what I've been playing a lot lately is my Vita and my um, new 3DS. But uh, mm -hmm. I played uh, a really cool game by uh, Ubisoft called Child of Light. And it is a very unique um, RPG. And um, RPGs generally aren't my favorite um, form of game like just because I don't have the time to play them uh you know these days like i used to but um it's it's just very beautiful uh it looks like a a children's uh fairy tale basically it, it's all like hand drawn animation mm -hmm. and um it's got a really unique battle system uh you use light to slow down the enemy's cast bars mm -hmm. and um it's basically a lot of like interruption uh in the cast times and all that but a great rpg um finished that and i loved it and you know it's really got me interested in playing more 
uh, RPGs here lately, even though, you know, with work and all that, time constraints kind of hold me back. But um, also I played... Uh, Wolf Among Us. Have you played that? The by Telltale. I haven't. I, I'm I'm definitely familiar with it, but no, I haven't played it yet. Really awesome game. I picked it up on the Vita. Um, mm-hmm. If you liked The Walking Dead, even though it's you know kind of completely different genre, um, it's kind of a detective um, story. Basically, the big bad wolf is the sheriff of Fable Town, and he's mm-hmm. uh, investigating some murders. And you know, it's got so many different characters like Sleeping Beauty and, you know, um, basically they're in, you know, uh, modern day city and mm-hmm. you're trying to find out the, uh, who murdered, um, uh, a prostitute, but, uh, really, really cool. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it kind of leaves it open ended. So I'm sure they're going to make a sequel to it. Sure. Uh, but that was really good. And, um, I played, a link between worlds again on uh, 3ds and that's mm-hmm. a great game if any of you haven't checked that out definitely play it it's one of the great zelda games that's come out in the past few years and um, as far as consoles i went and uh, got diablo 3 uh, which is one of the last games me and you played together Mm-hmm. Um, I got the Reaper of Souls edition and basically played it all the way through and um, played that last expansion. And uh, it was okay. Um, I've played through Diablo 3 about four or five times now. <laughs> and, and it, it <laughs> wow. kind of got it kind of got long in the tooth there toward the end of it just because yeah. I you know I was I've played through it so much. But uh, one thing that I did finally do on this uh, last one, um, is if you kill one of the, like, they have different type of trolls on this game now. You know, like, the treasure trolls pop out, and you have to kill them before they go through the portal. Well, there's yeah. actually special ones that will send you to, um, I forget what the name of the, Goldshire is the name of this um, hidden town. And it was actually in the original Diablo 3, but you had to, like, find all these like secret items and stuff so it's kind of like a easy way to get to it but you go through and it's just this like technicolor world and you're having to like kill unicorns and care bears and all this stuff i mean it, it's it's way out there but i found that like pretty cool to actually awesome. be able to play that but that's about all i've been playing here here recently that's cool. I haven't gotten to Reaper of Souls yet. Um, I'm glad that I waited and didn't pull the trigger on the 360 because I'd rather make the jump to the Expo because, like I said earlier, you don't have to lose any of your progress or anything like that. And it basically uh, looks like the PC version. Like You could tell that the 360 version was kind of dumbed down for the system, yeah. but um, this is very polished looking, um, you know, it was right up there with the PC version. I mean, of course, PC is going to have the best graphics, but you know, I mean, it, on a fifty-five inch TV, it looked great. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure it did. Well, that's cool. Thanks for the tip. I'm definitely gonna, you know, I was gonna pull the trigger on that anyways, but um, you know, now I have even more an incentive because I get to punish unicorns and care bears, which right. sounds, <laughs> when I'm having a bad day, that just sounds fucking awesome. Exactly. Um, let's see, as far as retro games, um, I actually have one next to me that I want to plug real quick, just for all you collectors and gamers out there, that would be Spike Out Battle Street for the original Xbox, has skyrocketed in value as of late, uh, for many reasons. One, it's one of the last true, like, co-op brawlers, um, actually published on disc, like, not Xbox Live Arcade, like an actual physical game, uh, for a console, at least that I remember. And on top of that... Um, you've got co-op, you know, one through four on the same screen, and you can do uh, one through four system link. Meaning if you want to run a local LAN game, you know, do an old school LAN party like the rest of us old farts that actually remember that shit. Um, you can do that where each person actually gets their own console and their own television. And if you like, like, Final Fight, you know, kind of Double Dragon type stuff where you're just running around basically as, like, your own kind of gang just beating the crap out of the other gang, um, this was actually used to be on Xbox Live, actually, as well. So you could your gang could take on another gang. This is awesome, um, and I think that's why the value on this has gone up so much is because 
it's it's one of the last few games on a console that you could actually do an effective LAN party with. And I look forward to inviting some friends over and doing that myself. So Spike Out Battle Street, original Xbox. If you can find it cheap, I got it for 16 bucks. I think. I got lucky. Pick it up. I'm going to have to Can't check that you. out. It's a lot of fun. I've never even heard of it before, so that's, that's a good little hidden gem there. It is. It's. It will be on part three of my Xbox Hidden Gem series uh, for all of you fans of those series. I just keep coming up with things to add to that, and people seem to enjoy it. But um, let's see. As far as game news, uh, E3? Yeah, let's uh, talk about that. We originally had wanted to get the podcast up and going like right around E3 so we could kind of discuss... Um, you know, all the games that were announced and all that, but um, life happens and we're kind of late to the game, but I guess better late than never. So, uh, yeah. you want to talk about what you uh, are excited about from E3? I could not be more excited um, about the new Doom and the new Fallout. Um, like a lot of people out there, Bethesda was definitely my favorite panel um, of all the ones I watched just because. There was no smoke and mirrors. There was no, like, you know, coming in 2019 or anything like that. This was like, guys, this is what we're bringing out, and it will be out, like, this year. And no, you know, pre-rendered trailers or anything. Like, no, we're going to actually play the game and show you what it's all about. Uh, so Bethesda, as far as I'm concerned, brought as, as far as software developers, brought to E3 exactly what every software developer should do. Just, like, bring the big guns and say, this is what we've got to offer. Uh, Doom killed it. Um, it's, it's, you know, the, the old school doom that I remember playing back when I was in high school, you know, to hell with reloading, you can carry as many guns as you want. It's just like in your face action, violent as shit, you know, just demons and stuff ripping people apart. I mean, to me, that's, that's doom, that kind of visceral experience, um, which, which that franchise, in my opinion, at least kind of grandfathered, you and know, I, it's just, I miss that, um, aspect of video games. Like, with Doom, you carry every fucking gun that you can get your hands on. Like, I don't want to, you know, I, like, that's one of my biggest gripes in Halo. It's like, yeah. you know, really I don't want to get rid of my sniper rifle. I, I want yeah. the sniper rifle. I want the rocket launcher. And I want the yeah. assault rifle, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I totally according agree with to, that. According to Mythbusters, it's actually possible to do that on that I episode saw that. where they tested that. I, saw that. I mean, awesome. they brought in like a, a pro MMA fighter, like a professional athlete, and he went through it with all the shit on him faster than they did without it. Right. So, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's a bit of a stretch, you know, mind you, but it's, it's not impossible. You know, right. it's not, it's not physically impossible. So, I mean, at the end of the day, guys, you know, it, it's a video game. Like, you're you're accepting suspension of disbelief the second you pick up the controller or, or you know, turn on the game, you know, basically. That, you know, that you're going to enter into a completely different world where the normal rules of our own world don't necessarily apply. And that's fine. You know, I mean, I, I, I have no problem accepting that a guy's carrying, like, ten different freaking guns that are, like, the size of, like you know, rocket launchers and stuff right. like that, like big, heavy 20, 30 pound guns. That's fine. You know, if it enhances the gameplay experience, rock on. <laughs> but, um, fallout in particular, and I have a little story for you guys, actually, um, with, you know, what they showed with the character creation system and just the, just the sheer scope of detail, uh, that they went into as far as how you could make your character different, like, and not just pre-rendered stuff. Like you literally, you know, take your controller or click your mouse or whatever, and you drag it and you, the, the face is your blank canvas, you know, to create anything you want to the point where they were boasting that like, you know, no two people are going to create the same thing. Basically like the odds of that happening are actually really slim. And that to me is really what Bethesda has always been about is always just like taking that RPG experience of customization and just pushing it to the next level and just saying, you know, this is this is what we're updating this time. We're going to make the world bigger. We're going to let you do more things, and it's it's the same Fallout that I remember playing the last two games. Just everything scaled up, which I don't think is a bad thing. That's exactly what I want. I want it to be Fallout. I just want more bells, whistles, toys, and a bigger sandbox. And I think that's probably what most Fallout people want. Um, the uh, the Pip Boy edition that they had announced at the show and. Tyler, you're going to have to correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I got my facts on this one. This, as far as I know, is the only time that a special edition of a game has sold out before E3 was over. I like, the pre-orders honestly on that were can't gone. remember um, another game 
selling that fast. And the crazy thing about it is it sold out pretty much. They had the Bethesda conference on Sunday night, right? Yep. It sold out by Monday morning because I didn't stay up to watch the Bethesda conference. I, I forget what I was doing that night, but, um, so I went to bed and I woke up and, uh, some of my friends were texting me. They're like, Oh, did you see the pit boy edition? And I'm like, nah. And he's like, yeah, I pre-ordered it. So of course I went to, uh, Amazon all sold out <laughs> and, um, <laughs> went to Best Buy and it, and my buddy texted me. He's like, uh, go to Best Buy, you know, hurry. Uh, they've still got some. So I went to click on it and it said available. Of course, once yeah. I clicked on it, they're like, oh, we're out of stock. So I was like, <laughs> shit. So this is one of the few times that I've actually went to Amazon and was like, please notify me when more are available. And yep. they actually uh, emailed me and I was able to get on and, and get some. Any other time I've ever tried that. You know, I've never been lucky enough to actually get one. So, uh, another thing that's cool that I don't know if uh, it was actually Bethesda that told Amazon to do this, but they limited you to one uh, pre-order because I tried to go back when they opened it back up again for a third time Mm -hmm. and pre-order one for my buddy that didn't get one and it wouldn't let me order one because I already had one pre-ordered, so... I think that's a good idea. Yeah, it is. It is. The resellers. The, yeah, I mean, Best Buy and the rest of the brick and mortar stores did not have that same limitation. Tyler, I shit you not. As soon as I, like you, like I didn't stay up for the Bethesda panel, I watched it the next day. And I went, you know, online, I hit Amazon, I hit all the usual sites to see if anyone had a pre order, and it was all gone. And I check eBay, and there's already people scalping this thing for like 150% of retail. And I'm right. like, these people make me sick. Like as a collector, I'm like, you guys are assholes. It's not even out yet. Not to mention like the pre-order wasn't closed. I'm like, so if somebody buys this, then they add more units to the pre-order, then what happens? You know, is eBay going to step in and be like this? Because they have they have a strict policy against price gouging where eBay will actually step in as a moderator and say, you know, you can't do this. Right. You know, not if it's an item that you can buy right now from Amazon, Walmart, Best Buy, etc. So... I actually discovered a site throughout the course of this because, like, I, I think the old psychology of this applies. Like, you know, if someone tells you you can't have the cookie, you just want it more. Because I wanted it really bad before this, but when I figured it sold out, I was like, God damn it, now I gotta get this thing. <laughs> you know, I, I totally bit the bug of consumerism. But um, there's a site called nowinstock.net that's totally free that you can basically set up um, alert bugs on all the major stores and you can search by products. So I lined up like Walmart, Target, Best Buy, Amazon. And you can actually have it send you a text within, I think, two seconds of them going live. And I got the text while I was sitting downstairs on the couch saying that it was available. And I was on Skype actually talking to a friend. I was like, hang on a second. I freaking ran upstairs to the computer, typed it in, boom, freaking got it. I was like, ooh. And dude, I shit you not. Less than 30 minutes later, I just went back to look at it. They were already gone on every single site just like that. I was like. This is double the cost of the actual game. It's $120, twice the retail cost of just the regular game. And it's probably outselling the regular game. Right. I've never I've never seen that happen before. Like the special edition is normally just for guys like you and me, but this almost became status quo. Um I would say, you know, for for everyone who wanted to play the game. Well, I um had kind of sworn off buying collectors editions. I'd gotten so many that I just had nowhere to put them. Yeah. And, you know, you buy a collector's edition, and, I mean, if it's really cool and it's like a, a beautiful statue or something, then, yeah, you know, that that's that's pretty cool to display on your, you know, shelf or whatever. But, I mean, like, some of them, I think I got the Witcher 2 collector's mm-hmm. edition, and it, it had, like, a fucking necklace, and, you know, why I needed that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it you know, and I had, like, this... I started getting this collection of shit that I would never use that I couldn't display and it was taking Mm. up a shit ton of room in my closet. So, um, I'd kind of sworn it off, but then I saw this pit boy edition. I was like, God, I've got to have that. I know. (laughs) I saw something. I was like, it's, I mean, it just went out the window. (laughs) What's, um, Todd Howard of Bethesda was the first to say, it's like, okay, most collector's edition are basically like a plastic piece of shit toy. And this is no exception. But this is a really cool plastic piece of shit toy. 
I right. was like, how can you argue with that? <laughs> He's even admitting like, okay, yes, this is for the dorks out there like us, and we're one of them. You know, we're some but of he's them, like, but you know if, what? It's if we're fun. going to make it, it's going to be the coolest fucking uh, yes. useless <laughs> piece of plastic piece of ever. Shit. I think that was and his exact quote. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was, I was great. Like, I, I was like, I, I love Todd Howard. I really do. That is That dude is not just a developer. That dude is like, he's the one of us who made it, you yeah. know, to like the big leagues. He graduated to basically being a professional nerd. And he still gets to do what he loves to do. He just gets paid a crap load of money for it. He's probably, you know, multimillionaire. So, um, I, I, again, just, I want to stress Bethesda A plus for, for E3, man. You guys, as far as I'm concerned, have set the bar for what software devs uh, should be doing for E3. Um, did you see the Xbox Live arcade game Cuphead? That's like in the 1930s cartoon style. No, I did not. Oh, actually. dude, it looks so amazing. I don't know when it's coming out. It might be on the um, summer arcade games that they release every year, but <laughs> but definitely look that up and just look at the footage. But it literally looks like you're in one of those like um, 1930 <laughs> cartoons, like the old school. And I think it's like a boss rush game, but it just looks really awesome. Um, that was a cool. micro. Microsoft exclusive, and uh, also I saw on the Microsoft press conference um, the Rare Replay, and I went. I was and, just about to bring that up. Yeah, that that shit's going to be clutch. Comes out uh, fourth of next month, and uh, thirty games. Uh, Smart move. Yeah, and thirty games for thirty bucks, and not just like thirty throwaway games, like thirty fucking awesome games. Right, I think Conkers is on that, and yep. I can't wait to see if that's going to have online. Because if you've ever played Conkers Bad Fur Day, the multiplayer on that mm -hmm. was amazing. Some of the best multiplayer you'll ever play. It's simple, but it's it's great. I mean, there's notes on how many afternoons. Back yeah. in high school, we spent you know playing over at my buddy Marshall's house and. Mm -hmm. You know, just p would play for hours on the beach. And for those of you who played Conquerors, you definitely know what I'm talking about on that level. But uh, Rare came out, you know, with um, guns blazing. Um, yeah. What about the pirate game? Did you see that? I forget the name of it, but um, it's like a it's a new pirate game from Rare, and I don't know if it's online only, but it looks mm. really sweet. Um, and it's going to be, of course, uh, Microsoft exclusive since Microsoft owns Rare. Yeah. And the other big news with Microsoft, uh, of course, there was a they announced a, another Halo and that looked great. Yep. Um, new Gears of War and the Gears of War yep. Collection, which comes out next month too. Um, I I want to get that. I wasn't entirely sold on that, but when I saw. The little stuff, you know, that they put on the tiles for you on the expo, where you check out the developer stuff, where they show what they've done. Right. Gears of War has never looked that good. I mean, it looks beautiful. Do you remember when that came out for Xbox 360? Yes. And just how much of a game changer it was. That was like that set the standard for like graphics on a console. People were right. like, "Holy shit!" You know, not to mention that just the fact that's like, okay, so I have a gun and a chainsaw, and it's like the same thing. Like, right. I don't have to change guns. It's like, wow, they took what Doom did and just, like, made it better. You know, <laughs> that's, that's wow. But the other uh, really cool news, and of course, you know, I'm a, um, I'm a big Metroid fan. And yep. uh, Retro Studios is apparently, I, I'm pretty sure it's Retro that's working with um, Mr. Inafune, who created Mega Man. And mm -hmm. they're making a uh, game called ReCore. And it was just, um, you know, your typical uh, CGI um, movie or whatever. You know, just mm -hmm. kind of a glimpse of the game. But it looks really cool. Um, it looks like the concept is you have like a core um, that you can put in different things. And the core becomes like your companion and you can use it in different ways. But... Um, it looks really interesting. I'm, I'm excited to see what that that game is. You know, when it when they tell us more about it. Um, you want to cover 
the PS3, what what came out? That's you're probably going to have to refresh my memory, but go ahead. All right. So we had some. Sony came out uh, swinging for the fences here. They definitely uh, were placating to the hardcore gamers. Um, mm-hmm. They're re-releasing. Uh, well, not re-releasing, but they're re uh, doing Final Fantasy VII completely. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, Final Fantasy fans, that's a lot of people's favorite Final Fantasy game. Yeah, that was big news. Um, of course, that's when they announced uh, Shimu 3. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, what? a lot of people kind of gave up on, on that ever, uh, you know, being made. Um, right. I, I remember two or three years ago, the. Um, creator had kind of thrown around the idea of maybe doing crowdfunding, right. and uh, from what I hear, the um, some of the Sony bigwigs kind of uh, saw him at a conference and they got to talking, and that's how uh, this kind of came about with the Kickstarter. But I assume you know it just ended last night, and Shimu Three is actually the. Uh, most crowd crowdfunded game on Kickstarter of all time now. Yeah. Um, what is what did it get up to? It got like six point three million or something. It actually um, went over uh, the oh shit I can't remember the name of it. It's the Symphony of the Night. Uh, yeah. Clone the Blood something. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, the guy who made Symphony of the Night. Uh, yeah. Shit. It's blood something. I'm yeah, totally I can't think of right now. either. But it, it passed it up. It passed up Mighty Number no. Nine by quite a bit. Um, so that was big news. And of course, uh, probably the biggest news was the Last Guardian, which has kind of been, um, you know, talked about being released for you know four or five years now, and yeah. uh, they actually had gameplay of that. But uh, I think probably the the more interesting of all of them was the footage of uh, Star Wars Battlefront. Yeah, uh, that looks amazing. Like that's yeah, looks that's going to be the the game of of winter. I think this year is, and I think everybody's going to be playing that because the Hoth footage looks yeah. incredible. As far as let's go back to the Shenmue thing. As far as that goes. Um, just uh, between everything that has transpired, you know, since that was announced, I think it's awesome um, that Shenmue Three is actually getting made. I remember playing that for the Dreamcast when it came out, and it being such a game changer. Um, but I mean, even the the developers of the game, you know, the guy that's pushing behind this is saying, like, you know, we're not going to be able to do true open world with like sub ten million dollars. Like, we're going to need double that, you know, to basically make this thing an effective modern game because. You know, I mean, the original game cost more than that, you know, way back when, you know, it, the, the first game was 13 or 14 million bucks to make. And I, I want to say it was over. Uh, yeah, I want to say that? it was significantly more than that. It's, it was a lot, to say the very least. And that was in like the, 19, the late 1990s or the right. 2000s. You know, things have changed a little bit now. And I guess my big question is. You know, it's cool that they kickstarted this, you know, just to kind of test the waters and stuff and and see who was actually interested. I don't I don't think either you or I were at all surprised for the turnout for this. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not a big shock that this thing got funded really quickly. But at the end of the day, Sony is basically going to have to fund the rest if they really want to make this thing uh, truly successful, you know, be what the creator of this wants to be. They're going to have to throw 20 or 30 million dollars at it um, in development costs and stuff. And to Sony, that's no big deal. You know, it's not like they don't have the money, so that that's no worries. So I'm kind of of two minds about this. Like one, yeah, you know, it's cool that games are getting more democratic. You know, as far as what gets made versus what doesn't. You know, people are voting from a capitalist perspective and voting from their wallet. So that's awesome that it's heading this way. But at the same time, it's just like Sony, you guys have got the money, man. Like, just. You're you're removing the idea of risk from the company. You know, it's like we're we're kind of taking that away from the companies where they don't have to take any type of risk to gain right. money. They just put the idea out there because that's and, exactly what it was. Uh, you know, I think they initially was were like, you know, we'll start the Kickstarter. You know, we'll 
definitely help fund the game if the Kickstarter is successful. Okay. Um, but you know, we we're we don't want to go that far out on a limb, you know, to see if people actually, you know, want this game and spend all this money developing it and you know it fall apart. But you know, you're seeing that more and more with game companies now, where mm-hmm. um, especially these big studios that you know one bad game can bring a a whole studio to its knees you know sure um you know we're seeing that with capcom here lately and konami and um you know they're putting hundreds of millions of dollars into the development of the games and they're probably at this point some of the development companies too big yeah and you know they're they have so many people on payroll that, you know, if they do have one bad game, then, you know, they have to lay a bunch of people off and all that. But um, THQ went under, um, yeah. you know, after... Uh, what was the bad game that... Because they had released um, Darksiders 2. Yep. And then... And maybe it didn't sell, you know, what it was supposed to or something. And, and it, you know, they went under. And you're just saying that more and more game companies now. You know, they hard to um hard to sustain that success you know over a long period of time but i think that's you know what was going on with shimu 3 is um you know the first two games were uh so expensive to make and then this third one and they you know back then i don't believe they sold you know that great they had a very dedicated audience um Mm -hmm. i got it you know on a um when it first came out, I remember reading the official Dreamcast magazine and, um, you know, looking at all the screenshots and how, you know, revolutionary that game was supposed to be when it came out. And it was, you know, for the time it was, um, and then you've seen how, how much it drove the price of the original two games up. It went, uh, I hadn't seen, um, fucking the Xbox version. Um, I've got both of them, but, uh, what did, what did it make Xbox, one uh shimu to go up to um i saw it in a retail store i think the weekend before e3 and you want to talk about like kicking myself afterwards because i never got around to the xbox version it was like 16 dollars, mm-hmm. which at the time was like the going rate i was like eh, you know i mean that's like retail it's not really that great of a price and i didn't buy it the last time I looked, it was between fifty and sixty dollars. Yeah, and that's what the uh, Dreamcast version is going for, and higher, up to. Which is, I find that so infuriating because mm-hmm. it's like you're inflating the price not because of reduction of quantity; it's it's pure demand. It is, and uh, yeah. you know, every time like a big podcast or a big YouTube channel, you know. Basically brings to light. Um. <laughs> yeah, like, you know. My, you, Mike and James, god damn it. <laughs> you know, a couple of um, couple of years ago, Musha was basically a $80 game on the um, Sega Genesis. And, um, you know, a couple of people started mentioning it. And, I mean, it went up. So you kind of got to, like, beat them to the punch. And now, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the games that were, uh, fairly common and easy to get that were hidden gems you know all the hidden gems on uh, different youtuber shows it's it's hard to scoop something up before the price goes up and to be to be perfectly honest i think on a very very small scale of probably a millionth of a percent I, i'm guilty of that as well this the number of comments that i've received um when i did my first uh uh, Xbox Hidden Gems for the original Xbox of all these people who actually genuinely hadn't heard of these games like Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth which I've had since it came out by the way I got that the day it came out not a repurchase never had to buy it again and I just kind of knew that that was going to be like a collector's item one day because it was so hard to get you know I was calling game stops and stuff and they, they didn't even know what it was I like yeah, yeah it just came out today because it didn't have like a big Com, you know, commercial press release or anything like that, even though it was published by Bethesda, you know, it's published by a major outfit. And, um, 
so many people have never heard of Hunt of the Reckoning or Grab by the Ghoulies and stuff like that. And, you know, Grab by the Ghoulies is a rare game. Like, some people consider it the last true rare game, as in made by the original team who did Conquer and Perfect Dark and all these other games that Rare is known for. That was, like, the last hoorah of the graduating class. And, in my opinion, it's probably my favorite original Xbox game, which is on the Rare collection, by the way. And, dude, <laughs> that game for a fucking dollar, oh, my God. Right. That's deal of the century right there everybody to needs to get that in shit. 1080p man i was like oh wow. and it's it amazes me how many people haven't heard of that game i'm like okay heard of conquerors they're like yeah i'm like heard of perfect dark I'm like yeah and then i just go down the list and they're like if you love those games you will love this game right. like this is like a love letter to this and so many un unintentionally adult jokes or maybe they were intentional like i mean just the name grab by the ghoulies and just all these little tidbits they throw in for the adults i was like this is actually a really profane game it's just that it's going to be a you know going over kids heads <laughs> but i mean you know as retro gamers it's yeah i mean are we exacerbating the problem by sitting online and talk about it to a much much smaller degree yes i mean we're we're definitely as guilty as anyone else does or anyone else is rather but at the same time you know i mean what what the hell else are we going to talk about i mean this is our, our mutual hobby and we're going right. to say like Oh uh, yeah, there's this game for this system that starts with T, and uh, you know we're not going to talk about it, but it's a really awesome game. So go get it. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, we we can't we can't exactly take right. that. Approach. But um, uh, that's about all I got for games. Do you have anything else? Um, we didn't cover Nintendo, and basically the oh boy, you Here know, we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, there's I'll not that much to cover. <laughs> Uh, no, right. All right, I, all right. Let, let's start off with something positive. There was one thing from their panel that I did like. The new Star Fox looks fucking awesome. Yeah, I want to play that game. Like when they showed the demo of the dude holding, you know, the gamepad up, showing the target. So I was like, this is why the gamepad was created. I was like, finally, like someone's doing it right. right. You know, on an original Nintendo title. Like this is why it's cool. And just the fact that this is probably the actually I can pretty much guarantee this is the only Star Fox game that we're going to get on the Wii U. Because oh, they're yeah. already talking about the NX, so this is right. this is probably it until next gen, ladies and gentlemen. So for the next probably five years or so, this is going to be it to get your Star Fox fix. What about the uh, Mario Maker? Did you see it? Yes, Mario Maker. I think is very very cool. I think it's awesome that you can create Mario stuff from different time periods. Like you don't just have to do the new stuff if you want to go back a couple generations and create something older. That's awesome. Um, I haven't had the chance to sit down and play it. I unfortunately didn't get into Best Buy when they were doing demos, but a couple of my buddies did. And they're like, "Dude, it is so much fun! Like, this is going to be the the cause of friends like hating each other, <laughs> like like somebody making a map that just is designed to be hell and putting it up against their friends. Like, bitch, you can't complete this. And don't get me wrong, I'm going to be doing the same thing. Like, remember Excite Bike when they had the level creator? And you'd always have that one asshole friend that would always make all the jumps like in a row. So you're like, really, man? <laughs> you know, like, you know, this, I think, is going to be like a resurgence of that. And that, in my opinion, is the one part, the one singular part of Nintendo's E3 uh, panel that's really specifically catered to guys like you and me, like the mm -hmm. retro collectors. Where they're like, you know, all that shit you love about Mario, how'd you like to do it yourself? Right. <laughs> Fuck you. Take my money. Sold. You know? <laughs> But um, as far as Nintendo, um, the Metroid thing, I know you're a Metroid fan. I was really disappointed with that. Dude, I, was I, like, I just knew this man. year. I knew I was it. Like, I, was really? like, I was like, we're going to get a Metroid, whether it's on the 3DS or we're going to get it on the Wii U. And to be, <laughs> to have, you know, the Strike Force game, I'm like, really? Like, think about all the potential that they could have used with the gamepad and the Wii U platform to make a kick-ass Metroid game, and it's not going to happen now. Right. Like, it's not. Like, you're not going to see a real, like, Metroid Prime, you know, t style game until Project NX. It's, it's not going to fucking happen. The internet exploded that day, and I'm, I'm glad it did because, um, you know, Metroid passed their um, anniversary um, a few years ago. And, mm -hmm. you know, they did big anniversary, um, you know, things for Kirby. I believe they did one for, well, I know they did one for Mario. They did one for Zelda. Yep. And, you know, yep. Metroid was completely left out. And uh, so and people people were really, they're, they're wanting another Metroid game. And, sure. Uh, sure. you know, I'm glad that they let 
you know, Nintendo know. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think now they'll probably start working on something if they weren't already. And maybe they were and they just didn't want to announce it. But, um, but yeah, I was, I would, needless to say, I was pretty disappointed in Strike Force or whatever the hell the, the game it's is. It's like, what the, why don't, why, it's, it, you know what it looks like? That reminded me of this, the whole, you know, infamous Super Mario Brothers 2 incident where they just took a completely different game and slapped Mario on it and was like, here's Super Mario Bros. 2, America. Right. You know, it's, it's just like, was this even developed as a Metroid game? Because <laughs> it doesn't look like it was. Well, you it know, looks like you just dumped they, it in there. They definitely slapped the name on there probably to sell games. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it has pretty much nothing to do with the universe. That I, no. You know, so I, I don't know what what they were thinking on that one, but hopefully Nintendo will get it, get it right. Uh, maybe in one of the later Nintendo directs this year. So, I guess we will we will wait and see on that one. You gotcha, man. Well, uh, Comic Con just happened. Do you want to? Uh, yes, let's I would cover love to that. take the lead on this, if if I may. I've, I've right. got a lot to say about this. Okay, so Comic Con these days is less about actual comic books. Although, to be fair, since like comic book movies are pretty much the big earners at the box office these days. Like, as I always like to say, like nerds, we won. You know, we we won the battle against the freaking haters. Our shit is the most popular shit in the world now. So fuck you guys forever making fun of us, man. Ha ha, we told you. You know, we're laughing all the way to the bank now. So um it's it's definitely cool that there is still that presence um at Comic Con, but it's become more of everything media i guess you could say you know now they do like stuff for video games like they do stuff for movies that have nothing to do with comic books and don't get me wrong i think that's great um i think that comic con has become bigger than what it actually was and so many good things this year the um the star wars thing of course was awesome it was really cool to get to see the behind the scenes reel with everybody just hanging out and talking and you didn't get to see too much from the original cast, but that didn't really surprise me. I know that they're they're saving that for the movie, and they were just bringing in the young kids and shit. And guys like you and me, it's like, do we want to see like Han Solo and you know Luke and Princess Leia and shit? Like, just talk. Like, I want to see a shot of them like just sitting there having a tuna sandwich and Gatorade, you know, on the side. It's like, dude, this is awesome. Like, like something that you and I probably never would have guessed would have ever happened again in our lifetime is coming back into the fold you know not just a new star wars movie but a new star wars movie with the people that we would define as the stars of star wars well that's a lot of stars um i i I just think that that's amazing um but the one subject that i want to touch on the most and um i'm I'm sure you're equally excited about this uh the ash versus the evil dead panel uh that they did where stars for any of you guys not to know um this was announced months ago and i almost jumped out of my fucking chair with excitement because i've been waiting for something like this since i was 14 years old um stars has basically greenlit a series uh with the um assistance production and oversight of robert taper bruce camel and sam raimi the three guys the three godfathers of the evil dead series um the first evil dead movie that i ever saw was army of darkness like a lot of people i missed the first two and I remember seeing commercials for it and stuff like that. And I originally watched it with some friends of mine who were kind of cine geeks. And they were just like, you know, this is like the third movie in a series, right? I was like, well, what's the other two called? They're like Evil Dead. I was like, well, what's Evil Dead? And we actually went to a brick and mortar store, Blockbuster probably, and rented the movies and actually watched them. And like, like my mind was blown that a horror and a comedy could exist in the same cinematic space. And I just fell so in love with the franchise, like I'm sure a lot of people did with the character of Ash and everything. And it's gone on to influence so many things. I mean, Doom, Duke Nukem, like all these things in pop culture. Like this is what started all of that. And when I got to see the actual trailer of, you know, Bruce Campbell, like strapping on the chainsaw, you know, putting on the glove and stuff like that and grabbing the double barrel, it's like, I was 14 years old all over again. Like the, it had not lost any of its appeal to me at all. I was so beyond excited. And I like that they're not trying to take away the fact that he's 30 years older, you know, that he was, than he was in the first evil dead movie effectively. 
and that, you know, he's an older ass, like he's still got it. But I mean, he's, he's a guy in his fifties and with him doing the thing where you think he's strapping on the hand, he's actually strapping on a girdle, you know, basically <laughs> like, yeah, I still got it. You know, like it's, it's still Ash. Like it's still him, which is really just an extension of Bruce Campbell. Like it's him with the volume turned all the way up and they show the blood and everything like that, which is just so ridiculously over the top, which is exactly what you want in something evil dead. You want it to be so bloody and ridiculous that it's actually funny. And my only complaint with this, to be really honest, is that the episodes are only 30 minutes. It's like, Oh, it's like right when I'm getting into it, Damn it! Like now, I gotta wait till the next week. That I find infuriating. But, dude, we're we're getting a new Evil Dead. It's not somebody else's version of the Evil Dead. Like Sam Raimi's written and directed the pilot and everything. He's signing off on this. He's overseeing the series. You know, Bruce Campbell, Rob Tapert involved. And like everything that you want to be involved in Evil Dead, I would honestly say that this is better than getting an Evil Dead four movie because oh, this yeah. can keep going. You know, with the with the advent of, we'll say, The Walking Dead, which really, at least in the most recent generation, pushed cable channel shows forward as far as what people can actually do. And on stars, they can literally do whatever they want. You know, since it's pay cable, it can be as bloody, violent, and as much fucks and shits, you know, as they see necessary. Right. So I I could not, as a fan of this series, man, I could not be happier that it's like everything from our childhood that was cool is still cool. Yeah, and and it's all being resurfaced. I love how they kind of stuck to the original formula with yeah. Army of Darkness. I mean, it looks like yeah. it's that same humor, dark humor, mm -hmm. campiness, you know. And uh, it definitely looks good. I watched the trailer earlier this week, and I was laughing all the way through it. I mean, it mm -hmm. looks hilarious. But, uh, yeah, I'm excited I for can't that, wait. too. It, it's the reason I'm going to get stars. I will get it just to watch that goddamn show. Like, <laughs> seriously i mean it's this this all right it's, i'm gonna go on i'm gonna go on record here this is my prediction folks okay so hbo has their online thing that doesn't need cable anymore showtime just kicked theirs off and they actually had a really good idea where they tied it into hulu um since it's all the same parent company so you can add it for like eight bucks to hulu which i that was brilliant stars has said like you know we don't have anything planned and blah 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 blah, blah. i think that's a bunch of crap i think that they've got something in the works because the other two have been so successful with their launch of this. And let's face it, this is the future of how people are going to consume media. Cable and satellite, I'm not going to say they're going to go extinct because you still need the internet. But I think the internet itself is effectively going to replace broadcast television. Yeah, um, It's, it's going to be a while. We're probably a good decade away from that. But that's the reason that it's heading, uh, the, the direction rather that it's heading because, you know, with the advent of broadband, I mean, you can get, 100 megabits per second, you know, through my provider Comcast in your house now, where 10 years ago, like even if you were a business and had the money for that, that was unheard of, you know, so being able to stream things now isn't that big of a deal. You know, we've got a lot more bandwidth to play with to the point where broadcasting over the air, you know, I mean, even in, in our circles with Google Hangouts and things like that, that's like our generation's version of live television and the, the whole YouTube thing and everything. I mean, you love it or hate it, ladies and gentlemen, YouTube is changing media. I mean, it's, it's the largest media platform in the world. So that in and of itself, and it kind of what it has become, I think is forcing, uh, the satellite and cable providers to adapt. Yeah. And just the sheer number of, um, content, you know, that's available. I mean, you go to HBO, you've got, you know, the entire Soprano series, you can sit there and watch, um, uh -huh. you know, whatever movies that they're offering at that time, um, you know, but they don't have tales from the crypt. What the fuck? Well, I, I recently did some research into that because I was a big tales from the crypt fan too. And, um, apparently there's some licensing issues uh. with tales from the crypt and it's kind of stuck in limbo for the time being with all the different entities that have, uh, you know, interest in, Tales from the Crypt, but uh, that's the reason that it's not on with the rest of the HBO stuff. But, Infuriating. but we were we were wondering the same thing because I would love to go back and watch, you know, some of those old Tales from the Crypt that I used to watch as a kid. Um, definitely, but you know, you said that this is going to be the one thing that 
you're going to have stars for, you need to check out Black Sails when you do get stars. I haven't gotten around to that. Is it any good? Oh, it's great. It's a is it? You know, set in the Caribbean, of course. Um, and it's you know all the pirate goodness you can ask for. I mean, it's it's great. It's very um, it's very HBO ish. So you you definitely want to have some scantily clad women and language oh, yeah. and all that. So. Um, but the action is great. Um, yeah. Season two was amazing, especially how it ended. So, um, you know, I did really like uh, Spartacus on Stars. That was the right. first show I ever watched with them. That was awesome. That I mean, you know, going back to Sam Raimi and Rob Taper, you know, they had some involvement in that as well, and that was like, wow, like this. This is what television shows can be these days. Well, keeping along the same lines, let's go in the the other spectrum of stuff that we're not looking forward to what about what about the supergirl have you seen the previews for that all right um to be fair full disclosure ladies and gentlemen i am a huge dc comics fan i'm not a marvel hater i want to be very clear about that guys i love the avengers i love thor i love iron man i watch all of that shit i don't discriminate i'm an equal opportunity comics nerd um okay so Am I holding out reservations for seeing this show? Yes, but there is one thing I think this show has going for it, which is at least going to make me check the pilot out and just see what it's all about. The guys that are running Arrow and Flash, who I adore. I, those are two of my favorite television shows, in my opinion. That is how you do a comic book TV show correctly. That is the reason why I think, in my opinion, DC is kicking Marvel's ass as far as TV shows are concerned. Marvel is still ahead in the movie thing, DC's kind of slowly getting with the getting with the program on that, but dude, as far as TV, DC's smoking Marvel's ass. Um, mainly because when you see a TV show about comic book stuff, anything comic book stuff, I get the point of Agents of Shield. I really do, but I don't give a fuck about the people behind the scenes. I don't care. I'm I not really a fan of it. I, I, I want to watch superheroes, dude. I want to see. Green Arrow, and I want to, they're crossing over the shows where Green Arrow and Flash are like, you know, becoming one and shit. I'm, I was like, guys, they are doing this perfectly. I mean, and some people are upset because they don't incorporate into the movies. Guys, I don't want them to do that. Like, seriously, like, do I think it's cool that Marvel's doing that? That they've got one big thing where the shows and the movies exist? Sure. But in DC's case, I want them to be separate. I want the movies to be together and I want the shows to be together. So you can have like parallel universes of things that get together. And then they've got, uh, what is it? Legends of tomorrow where they're getting like everybody from every show, like into one big show. And then anyways, the, the, the whole point I was making with Supergirl, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, was the guys who run those two shows are writing this. Like they are the creative control over this show. Given how great a job they've done, with their other two shows where they literally just hit the ground running from episode one. I at least owe them a shot with this where I'm going to say, all right, let me check out the pilot. If it sucks, I don't have to watch it, but they've got a really good track record so far, dude. I mean, they do. And I, I think the big gripe, a lot of people were having was that, you know, because it was a woman, you know, being the, um, main character, um, they, kind of always did that cliche, you know, she's a superhero, but she can't get her love life together. And, you know, all this, like, a, you know, the cliches that you have with women lead characters. And I think that was yeah. the big thing that they, they had gripes about, but I don't know. I'd, I'm, I was a big fan of Smallville back in the day. Um, Me too. About season five, uh, it started kind of losing its way or maybe season six. And it, it kind of got, um, they probably should have ended at about season seven or so, but mm -hmm. it went on a little too long, but man, those first few seasons of small, Smallville were just amazing. So, yeah. you know, if it's something like that, then yeah, I'll watch it. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of afraid to admit this to you, but I actually haven't watched any Arrow or Flash. Oh. Dude, oh, nerd failure. I know, oh, right? Brother, you are missing two of the best shows on television right now. Well, I've got Seriously. an excuse. I've got an excuse. I, I actually just started, uh, or I just finished Orange is the New Black uh, 
season two, which was okay. or season three, which was great. And um, I just caught up with three seasons of Banshee. So that's okay. an amazing show. If you um, like action, uh, definitely check out Banshee. Uh, it's a Cinemax show, but uh, it's great. Great, great, great show. Um, I want you to get caught up on those two shows so that I have someone to talk about it with and we can talk about it on the podcast. They are honestly that fucking good. Seriously. Well, see, my parents just went through and like watched the entire series. And so they've been they've been on me too about it. So it's I've really got good. To, I've got it. And I think they went through and watched all the Flash too. But uh, yeah, they're um, very different shows. Like you can tell where they commingle, but they definitely did not just recycle the same thing that they did with Arrow and the Flash. It is definitely its own thing. The tone, the feel, everything. Completely different character because, well, the characters themselves are completely different. You know, I mean, Barry Allen, the Flash, is like the goody two-shoes good guy. You know, he's the guy who always does the right thing. Ollie Queen is more like Batman, where he's dark, he's got a past, he's got, you know, a head full of freaking bad shit that happened to him in, in his past that made him who he is. And uh, it's, you know, his approach to things, like when they finally cross the shows over for a little two-part thing where they, they met um, and actually teamed up to kick some, you know, supervillain ass, you can see how different their, their approaches to crime fighting are because they're almost at odds with each other um, to the point where they actually get in a fight. And most people are like, dude, Flash would kick freaking Arrow's ass. I'm like, guys, this is the same thing as like, you know, like the Superman Batman thing. Okay, yes, one of them is super powered and one of them isn't. But one of them is a young kid and the other guy is like a battle tested strategy master, you know, who has to who is used to having to think his way around people stronger than him. There's something to be said for that. I mean, there right. really is. And the way they did it, it wasn't cheesy at all. Like it's I, I won't spoil it for you, but when they when the flash and the arrow actually go toe to toe you're going to see the strengths and weaknesses of each one. And they leave it on a cliffhanger at the end where he's like, you know, Arrow and you know, like Barry and Ollie meet up. And he's like, you know what? It's like, this has got us both wondering who would win you or me if it came down to it. And they've got the thing, you know, where they're running towards each other, fade to black and you never hear anything else about it. So we're nice. never going to know who, who won. So they just kind of leave it to the nerd debate. And it's like, the guys who write this show, man, they're basically us. Like, this is what we want to see. Like, you know, like, dude, who would win? You know, if you put these guys in a room together, just they answer all of those questions. It just seems like the guys who write this and the guys who put this out are fans of the material. And it shows when they put out the shows. I never thought I'd see Gorilla Grodd on television, but the fucking Flash is doing it. I'm like, dude, there's like an ape supervillain and it doesn't look stupid. Like, I don't know how they did this because I couldn't have, but it looks awesome. You know, right. he's actually scary. So I'm going to give Supergirl a go. I don't know whether it's going to be good or not, but I've got to put my faith in these two guys. They know what they're doing. I want to give it a shot. Well, I, just I think we're going to have a good dynamic because you're the um, DC fanboy and I'm the Marvel fanboy. So we're going to have a good <laughs> dynamic. And I will take right. up for Marvel on the TV right. side. Yes. Oh. Yes. Uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D wasn't that good but no nope. daredevil daredevil okay was great. Right. i didn't even think of that okay but to be fair um agent carter i actually liked mm -hmm. that i thought was very well done because it's it's a period piece but it's even though it's not revolving around superheroes they made it interesting right i actually really liked that but no daredevil dude that i, I love how the, marvel's taking risk and they're actually letting yes. Letting them be a little darker with it, you know. Not everything Dude. has to be PG thirteen, you know. No, so, hell no. So that, I'm glad the, they did that. The Daredevil first season, I think, is one of the best first seasons of any television show in history. Yeah. Not just comic book shows. I'm talking any fucking TV show. the The last episode of that, I'm not going to spoil it for any any of you guys who haven't seen it. I was like on my feet, fucking cheering. You know, when you actually get to see him in the suit for the first time, you're like, and. He didn't do the new Chucko thing. That was my only real fanboy complaint. But I mean, he's got the fucking baton and everything. You're just like, right. yes! Like, this is scratching so many nerd itches of mine right now. And Vincent D'Onofrio as the kingpin. Oh, yeah. Dude, fucking home run. Like, like, that dude was born to play this part. He's physically intimidating, but he's also this dude where you're genuinely afraid of this guy. Like, this dude is fucking ruthless. 
Right. You know, I mean, he, he would make a great Bond villain, you know, let alone the Kingpin. It's, he's such a great actor. So, no, you're absolutely right. Daredevil, yeah, that's – that Daredevil I saw as Marvel's response to, like, DC coming out swinging, like, well, we're going to do a so, show with superheroes. Like, if you want to do a show with regular people, that's fine. We're, we're going to bring our A game. And Marvel's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's great. I think I want them to be competitive because we win right. when they are. We win as the consumer. So, yes, I'm looking forward to uh, Luke Cage. I'm looking forward to Jessica Jones. I am absolutely looking forward to Iron Fist, man. He's such an underrated character. I fucking love that guy. And most importantly, the Defenders, when they all come together for the same show. That is so cool that they're actually doing that, man. And God bless Netflix for doing this. That They, they are definitely... I mentioned earlier, YouTube, Netflix is the other company that's kind of the thorn cable and satellite side right. um, that, that's changing the dynamic of how we consume our media. And it's so awesome that you get the whole series. How, how long did it take you to blast through Daredevil? Uh, I want to say maybe one week. It was after work. I would watch like two or three episodes every it night. It took me so. less than a day. If I had time off, it would have been it, it would have been a day. My girlfriend actually used that as like an icebreaker into comic book, you know, shows and movies, and uh, she actually blasted through it um, probably in two days. Um, she's off for the summer; she's a teacher, and nice. uh, so she's been off all summer. So I've been trying to kind of get her in the nerd culture a little bit. You know, my next. Awesome. My next project is to get her to start playing some video games with me. So we'll Dude, we'll see how that turns out. You and I have that in common because uh, my girlfriend is actually a really big uh, comic book fan, or rather a Marvel movie fan, rather. She loves the Avengers and all that other stuff. And, excuse me, I'd never heard of Daredevil. And uh, has Netflix. I was like, you need to check this out. She's like, well, I don't know anything about it. I was like, trust me. And she went through it in less than a day. She was like, nice. I could not stop watching it. This was so good. She's like, I can't believe we have to wait for season two. I was like, I know. <laughs> like, like that's almost the the catch twenty two about getting the whole thing all at once. Is that you know when you cook through it in a day, then you have to wait a whole year <laughs> for that right. next day. And like, oh, it's like you almost want to pace yourself because it, it makes the pain of waiting uh, that much less, in my opinion. All right, I've got one more uh, TV show that. Um I almost forgot to mention, uh, but I'm really excited that they're kind of rebooting it as Heroes. Yes, I was a big fan of the original Heroes series. I thought it got a lot of unnecessary flack. Uh, the first season of Heroes, if you've never watched it, any of our viewers or listeners, um, probably one of the greatest first even seasons of TV of all time. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I think the problem with Heroes is they probably, that should have been the climax of the entire TV show, them saving the planet. But, right. um, you know, I, I think it, they kind of lost their way a little bit after season one. Um, yeah. You know, I, after, you know, the world's going to be destroyed, you know, and you prevent it. Sorry for any spoilers out there if you've never seen heroes you're about five or six years too late but yeah um you know after that it's kind of hard to think of a premise that's going to go above that yeah and uh that maybe they should have maybe did like a slow burn at first and then you know kind of ended on that note but mm -hmm. you know my god the first season of heroes is still amazing and i'm i'm glad they're actually going to try and reboot it um I've seen some articles that still refer to it as a mini series. Like a it's like thirteen episodes. So I don't know if yeah. this is a one off or what. I, but. for right now I think it's supposed to be a one off and it's like a we'll see. Right. We, okay. which is fine. You know, dude, we're getting more heroes. I don't give a shit. Right. Give me more heroes. And I I was glad to see they're bringing back a lot of the original characters from Heroes. Mm -hmm. Um so you, you cannot do heroes without Hiro Nakamura. I right. mean, it's just it would not be the same. But of course, I've got the man with the horn rim glasses. The policeman I saw is coming back. Yep. Um, did you see anybody else? That was the, mm, the doctor. From the original is show, the I think it's it, maybe. Oh, um, the Haitian dude. 
the guy who's like the the anti power and like his power subdues the rest of their powers. He's back in it. I can't okay. remember his name, but the Haitian guy. I th- didn't they just call him the Haitian? Like yeah, that was, I believe that was so. his name or something. I believe so. So yeah, he's he's in it. Um that's the only bunch that I can think of. But that's that's really exciting. Um never thought we'd get to see, you know, heroes again and that's really one of the the great failures of NBC, I think, was yeah. because that show was so hyped after that first season and just uh kind of fall off like it did. Um yeah. You know, it was pretty epic at the time. Uh, how bad it <laughs> it yeah. ended, but um, but glad to see that we're possibly going to get a reboot. Um, that would be nice. Did you want speaking wanna... of reboots? Oh, not not a reboot, but a, we'll we'll say continuation. Um, we're getting the X Files back on television. Oh yeah, a, yeah. A limited, uh, I guess. How many or episodes? 13, okay, like twelve or thirteen, I think, something like that. So we're just getting. That that seems to be like almost the formula these days, where you get, you know, seasons are getting shorter. But I mean, the upside is is that they can crank them out a lot faster. You know, when you're not stuck doing twenty two to twenty four episodes, you could put one out or put two seasons out within the less than the course of one year. So I, for one, dude, we're getting new X Files. No, not a reboot with two total strangers like fucking Fox Mulder and Dana Scully, the people you want in the X Files, right. and this is like. 20 years later, you know, what happens after, you know, the world's changed, you know, post nine 11 and all this other stuff. So, um, I'm looking forward to seeing how they handle it. Is X files still up on Netflix or did they take it down? Yes. Okay. Still up. Last I looked, it was, I think was less than a week ago. I think that's something that I need to go back and just rewatch. Sure. Cause it's been years and years since I've watched any X files. And I, I just, am curious to see on, you know, how it's aged since I yeah. watched it back in the day. But, uh, man, that was a great show. I remember, you know, sitting around with my parents watching that every week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's uh, probably going to be cheesy as shit now, you know, because it's like <laughs> mid nineties. You know, people are going to be like, "Oh, this was so violent." Now we look at it these days, where we have like The Walking Dead, where people are getting torn apart on basic cable. Right. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> no, like <laughs> this really didn't push that many boundaries right. not by today's standards. But we, I, like I said, we're getting X Files on TV, so nerds, yeah. We've got it made right now. Well, um, since you're the DC man, do you want to cover the the movies? Absolutely, because I've got so much to say about both of these. The two elephants in the room these days that seem to be dividing people. Okay, so um, let's first talk about Suicide Squad. Um, since that's the smaller of the two movies, uh, the other being Batman v Superman. Okay, so I'm very familiar with this. Um, the Suicide Squad, um, they've touched on it on Arrow and Flash, actually, um, where they've actually had episodes involving the Suicide Squad, um, where you even, I, I don't think we'll ever see this again, but just little mini spoiler for Arrow, where you see a girl with her back to you inside of a cell with blonde ponytails sticking out and this very, very familiar high-pitched voice kind of talking and like psychobabble, and it, it's very obvious who it is, it's Harley Quinn. They never show her face or anything like that. But, I mean, they've done whole episodes of the Suicide Squad on the show where Deadshot and, uh, you know, Deathstroke and everybody, you know, the rest of these guys are involved. So I definitely love the concept and the idea and the characters. Uh, The movie itself, like, the trailer itself, they've definitely got the right idea, you know, that they're, they're, they're the bad guys, basically, you know, cutting them loose and... Uh, to to do good and trying to control them, it's a little bit cliched in its premise. Where like, oh, you know, they're they're trying to think for themselves. Blah 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 blah. You know, if they do anything wrong, we're just going to pull the switch and their heads are going to explode. That's been done plenty of times. But at the same time, um, the one thing that annoyed me, I know that this is really going to divide the audience here because it seems to be hot, cold, no gray area on this. I am not a fan of the Joker in this. I'm not. And I know a lot of people are. They think it's Jared Leto and he's brilliant and blah, 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 blah. And dude, guys, he's a freaking fine actor. For anyone who's seen Dallas Buyers Club, he was spectacular in that movie. That was so awesome. But at the same time, guys, the the, the grill and the tats are just fucking killing it for me. And what really irritates me about that is that the producers of the movie flat out lied. You know, when that picture of him, you know, in the ah, home alone face 
came out and like the internet imploded because people were like, this sucks. And some people were like, this is brilliant, how, which is how it always happens with this shit. Um, they said that they were just doing that because it was the anniversary of the Joker and it was an enhanced picture and stuff like that. And the ink and the grill, like not like none of that's going to appear in the movie. So I was like, okay, whew, you know, disaster averted. Anyone who's seen the trailer knows that's bullshit. He's wearing the ink. He's got the grill. Uh, the fan theory as far as why he's got the grill, which is something I figured out in the first five seconds, Batman likely knocked out all his teeth. Okay. Does that make logical sense? And would that probably happen with the way Batman rolls? Yes. And that's great that it makes logical sense. But guys, you are literally by doing this, dumbing down the most recognizable trait of the Joker. When people think the Joker, they think the quote Joker smile. And now he looks like fucking Flava Flav. <laughs> what the hell? Like, why would you think that would make him more interesting? He looks stupid. Like, it just looks so dumb. Like, I don't care how grounded in reality is. I don't care if it's grounded in reality. I don't care how many beatings Batman has given him. I want him to still have his teeth. <laughs> I don't care how stupid that is. Like, I don't care how unrealistic that is. I want him to be like, e you know, have the Jack Nichols and Joker smile because that's what he's supposed to look like. So that was my one big beef with that. Other than that, Will Smith is dead shot. Uh, that's, that's my big, stretch. that's my big thing. And I'd, I don't know, like everything Will Smith has been in lately. It's like he, he has his hand in it. Like, you know, I want my character to do this. I want to be yeah. the, the lovable bad guy in this, you know, and I want to be the sympathetic bad guy. I want to no be the sympathetic assassin to this. But, you know, like, I don't know. It, the His past few movies have been not that great. Um, Box Office Poison, I think, is putting it lightly. Focus wasn't that good. Uh, I watched that last week. And um, what was the... After after after, after Earth, Earth. Ugh. Ugh. yeah, that, that was terrible. But I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping this is good. I'm gonna give the benefit of the doubt. Um, I will too. I'm gonna give. It a I'm shot. actually kind of in the other camp of the Joker. I think it is interesting just to see a different aspect. Mm. Out of all the Jokers, they've all brought something different to the table. Um, Jack Nicholson was the over the top. Joker, very campy. A lot mm -hmm. of that was probably Tim Burton's direction. Um, Heath Ledger, to me, is the quintessential, like, lunatic. I mean, you know, I, I think that's as good as it gets. He definitely deserved the Oscar that year. Um, and this, you know, is something completely different. I'm just interested to see what he brings to the character. Whether it's good or not, I guess we'll see. I'm not going to, you know say it's going to be bad or good you know a right. lot of a lot of people are throwing out this is going to be fucking terrible and and all that you know I, i'm not going to say that i'm just gonna wait and see but um it's definitely one of those trailers that and it's very few times this happens now but it's one of those trailers that gives you goosebumps that and um batman versus superman which i'm sure we'll cover in a minute but yes. um and star wars i mean like there's just not many movies now that that do that and yeah. um you know that really open your imagination to um to what's going on in the movie and um you know i, I think it's going to be good um i definitely really enjoyed the Zack snyder um superman and his Man of steel i i did too and I and don't, dude, I don't get people. Superman fan here, dude. Life, I'm a fucking lifer of the character. I just, anyways, I'm sorry, God. Well, I just don't get people's hate for Zack Snyder. I don't I, either. He's made some great fucking movies. I know. Like everyone forget how good 300 was. Yeah, I mean 300 and that was a was, comic book movie, and he was, fucking destroyed yeah, that movie. And it was fucking looks. I mean, if, if it's the closest thing to the actual source material. As it can be. I mean, it it was it looked great. Now, 
Sucker Punch was a stink fest. I mean, it it was horrible. Let's let's admit that. But um, Dawn of the like, Dead. I was, should go, I should go back to comic books now. <laughs> I <laughs> love but, Dawn of the Dead. Watchmen. We we cannot forget Dude, Watchmen. I love Watchmen, and there's Me so too. many people that hate that movie. And oh, why? That, I don't get it. And and I've got it's the, so close to the comic book. Like they changed the stupid octopus thing at the end was like the only thing they left out. I'm like. What more do you want? Rorschach was everything I imagined him to be. Hell yes. And uh, you know, I've got the I've got the graphic novel, I've got the comic books, the Alan Moore yeah. comic books, and yeah. you know, I I don't get it. Like, you know, there's a lot of people that love to hate Zack Snyder, but I like Zack Snyder. I, I, I mean, loved no, I Dawn loved of the Dead, Man's, you're right. Yeah. I mean One every, of his first movies, dude, he killed it. Pretty much everything he's put out has been yeah. great except for sucker punch and yeah I, you know sucker punch they probably just gave him free reign to do yeah. whatever after um 300 Zack Snyder, he needs a writer yeah like like he does like dawn of the dead for example was written by james gunn who did uh guardians of the galaxy oh okay so i didn't know that it, it's not a big he also wrote scooby-doo which is like uh yeah. <laughs> well he well, can't win them all but <laughs> but no i mean he comes back and he writes after scooby-doo he writes the dawn of the dead one i was like it's written by the fucking scooby-doo guy what's what the hell does he know about zombies but dude dawn of the dead the remake and i'm sure i'm gonna get some freaking hate from the romero friends guys i love the original romero movies they're fucking awesome but i'm gonna call a spade a spade here the second dawn of the dead is head and shoulders above the original as far as what's the better movie infinitely better than the original i love the original dawn of the dead but they was like like oh they're not slow zombies slow zombies are scarier okay guys that's subjective i don't think a slow zombie is scary i think a zombie that runs like a fucking kenyan that shit is scary right because you can't just be like weaving in and out of them you know like no you actually have to run you know or better yet need a car and that was the whole thing with with adding um, Andy, you know, the guy who's on the other side of the freaking lot, you know, adding a character who wasn't in the mall that they could communicate with. I was like, guys, this is what makes a good writer. I understand it's a plot device, but it's a really fucking great plot device. Right. Like this gives us so much exposition and a dynamic between the characters because they're not that far apart. They're like a couple hundred yards apart physically, but it might as well be the fucking Atlantic Ocean because it's a, there's an ocean of the freaking undead waiting down there to rip them apart. So let's let's talk about Batman versus Superman. Obviously, since we're going on a Zack Snyder tirade here, okay. This one is definitely dividing people a lot more than Suicide Squad. And I've, I was having a conversation with a good friend of mine, Robert. Love you, buddy. Um, who he's not a DC hater. He's really not. He is almost as big of a fan of Superman as I am. We've had many conversations about it, but. As far as the movies, he's kind of more on the Marvel side. You know, he's he's definitely leaning towards that. He wanted Man of Steel to be good, but like a lot of people, he was just really disappointed. Like, I want to see the big blue boy scout, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, guys, I'm all for that, man. Like, I really am. I'm for Superman being fucking Superman. But at the same time, I'm one of the few people who instantly got it in the end of Man of Steel. Spoilers for like all three of you who haven't seen it. Um, when he snapped Zod's neck. Like in that instance, maybe it's just Henry Cavill being an experienced actor. It immediately registered with me what that moment signified. That this was basically Superman becoming the big blue Boy Scout. Like because he literally had to kill the last of his kind. Basically singularly orphaning himself and making himself the last Kryptonian. In that motion, even though, you know, did Zod have it coming? Did he deserve to die? Absolutely. He's a fucking murdering psychopath. Yes, he needed to go. But Superman literally destroyed what was left of Krypton, with the exception of him, to save Earth. And at the same time, that made perfect sense to me why that moment would be the reason why he chooses not to kill. You know, for the same reason that Batman chooses not to kill because it happened to his parents. And he's like, I don't want anyone to feel like me. I think Superman in this version is kind of taking that same path. He doesn't want anyone to have to feel what he had to feel to kill one of his own kind. Because let's face it, Superman is the ultimate immigrant. He's the last of his species and there's no one else in the universe like him. Like him being himself makes him inherently different. 
you know, he's always going to have to walk a different path from everybody just because he's not human. He's a fucking alien. So, you know, a literal alien. So I applauded Zack Snyder for taking that risk. You know, this is the first time on screen we've ever seen Superman take a life. And all the people are like, Superman's never fucking done this. All right, first of all, if you're saying that, you don't know shit about comic books, all right? Superman has actually killed several people. Um, it's not been in a murderous, like, his brain's being taken over kind of way. No, he just recently destroyed an entire planet um, accidentally with Damn his stash. new power call well, yeah he did he did technically um but he has a new power called solar flare which is basically an extension of heat vision where as batman explained it superman cells i'm going to totally geek out with you guys here you're about to be fucking science so buckle up uh superman cells each of them individually are like miniature solar batteries where they basically contain solar radiation which make him who he is and he inadvertently through throughout the course of this particular comic book arc accidentally unleashes the solar energy from every cell in his body all at once. So it's kind of like heat vision without any control, like where he's basically setting off a solar bomb. And you've seen what he can do just with heat vision. Man, it's still, he's cutting buildings in half like a fucking chainsaw. Imagine a nuclear bomb powered by that same technology. It literally destroyed an entire planet. And he took the bad guy with him. Granted, he didn't do that willingly. He just got pissed at this guy. And yeah, fuck him. I'm going to take out his whole planet too. And he doesn't remember anything. He wakes up and he's like, what happened? And Batman's like, I think you basically created a solar bomb. So I couldn't, uh, going back to the core subject here, Batman versus Superman. Um, I think, and I, I'll never be able to say this for sure. And even if they go on record explaining this, as far as was this the plan the entire time? Um, was this, you know, going to be the direction that they were going to head with the movies? Or was this a reaction to people not liking the the end of Man of Steel where, you know, he's knocking down buildings and like Metropolis, Metropolis is basically in ruins as a result of his actions. To be fair, all the Marvel fanboys saying that same thing. Guys, did you see the fucking Avengers? Uh, New York was a fucking bomb zone after they were done. I didn't hear anyone complaining about that. And I think they did probably a lot more damage. They're like, well, the aliens were invading New York. Okay, guys, Superman was dealing with a world engine. What the hell did you want him to do? Just move it to Ontario or something like that? Or the North Pole? He fought the bad guys where they were, same as the Avengers did. So let's cut the bullshit here. I've got a question real quick. Yeah, shoot it. You know, in all this discussion about them destroying the cities, did... Was the point lost on anybody that we're talking about a fucking movie that there wasn't really, <laughs> what, there wasn't really destruction, guys? It's okay. Metropolis isn't real. It really didn't get destroyed. New York City's okay. You yes. know, monsters didn't you know come through and destroy the city, guys. We're talking right. about a fucking movie. Like, I know, and a comic book movie, no but, less. But see, one thing that I loved about Man of Steel was it Sorry. showed. It showed it was the one Superman movie to me that showed Superman's real power. You know, I mean, if two basically basically gods are fighting each other, a building isn't going to be shit. And (laughs) I mean, you know, cutting buildings in half with your heat vision like that is how it would be in real life. And pretty much, regardless of how many dollars and damage they did or whatever, you know, I think that's what would what it would be like if two gods were to do battle. And uh, even though, you know, Superman's not a god, but I mean, you know, of course, in our, close. in our planet, I mean, he, I, I don't know one superhero that really comes close to, no. to I'm sure all the most Superman's power. Thor and the Hulk. Guys, really? Seriously? Like, against Superman? Like, no, no, I don't think so. Somebody's got to be at the top. Why not him? And, That's and we're just talking about the invulnerability and, the ability to fly and all that. I mean, he's got everything, he's, you know, unless you have kryptonite, you don't stand a chance. That's right. literally, or you can block out the sun. And in which case, all you're going to do is make him run his battery down. That's really the way he works. He's a giant moving solar battery. So as long as earth has the yellow sun and it's still shining, he's not going to run out of juice. It's, it's just that simple. So, okay. So onto the trailer. Okay. In my opinion, God, I hope I'm right about this. I think that this was the plan the entire time. I do not think that this was a knee-jerk reaction to people being mad about what we were just talking about with buildings being knocked down and them addressing it. If it is, if this is actually them kind of catching up to pop culture, guys, 
bravo. That's smart writing because they're rolling with the punch. It's like, okay, well, why don't we make this work in the movie? Making Batman there at ground zero while this was actually happening, given who Bruce Wayne is, you know, it would, it's not a, a stretch of the imagination that he would have a building in Metropolis if it's supposed to be this huge New York sized city in the middle of the heartland, you know, out west that doesn't actually exist. Um, it would make total sense that Wayne Enterprises would have a building there and he might have been there on business or something, maybe to talk to Lex Luthor or, you know, something because he's a, you know, freaking mover and a shaker, right? And just seeing like Bruce Wayne look up at the building and I don't know if you guys have seen this, I don't know if you have seen this, but they uh, tweeted a little vine showing how the two movies perfectly sync where Zod is using his heat vision and it shows the perspective of Bruce Wayne where you see the heat vision cutting through the building. It literally matches up perfectly. Like oh, they've, wow. they put that much thought into this where you can see these two things happen in real time. It's a one to one. I was like, wow, they really did their homework. And it's, does it make sense that someone like Bruce Wayne, who is the definition of paranoid in a good way, I'm, I'm not saying it's bad. He is the ultimate paranoid superhero because he always has to be ahead of everyone else. Would he see Superman as a threat? Absolutely. I mean, cause this is like his first run in with a metahuman or in Superman's case, an alien, you know, someone who's all of his technology and everything. It's just like at the end of the day, dude, I mean, like you said, Superman's a God. I mean, it's like this dude is basically so far beyond humans capabilities, even with technology. It's just, unless you got kryptonite, you don't stand a chance. Would he be, would he see Superman as a threat? Totally. And what do you see, like, you know, him being there in the aftermath is very 9-11-ish, if you watch it. It almost looked like, it reminded me, at least, of the towers coming down. You know, and somebody standing there at ground zero, like this kind of 9-11 level event where a major city is basically demolished um, because of, well, I guess you could call Zod's team terrorists. I mean, they were trying to take over the world, basically. And let's not forget, ladies and gentlemen, that Superman stopped the terrorists and saved the goddamn planet. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we had to sacrifice one city. Six billion lives were saved. Yeah, okay, I think that's noteworthy. But, and I think it's cool that we all know how it's going to end, that they're going to put their differences aside and realize that neither of them are right, or neither of them are wrong, and both of them are right. They have different approaches to things, like Batman's thing is paranoid and planning and everything like that, and Superman is Superman. Like, he always looks for the good in people. He always tries to diffuse the situation rather than resulting to violence. And I think Zack Snyder really nailed it in the end of Man of Steel when Superman's standing there and he took down a satellite because they were basically trying to spy on him. They're like, you know, you know, we're just not sure what your intentions are from America. And he's like, really? I'm from Kansas, dude. I mean, it's just like <laughs> Superman is America. He's baseball. He's apple pie. He's like, he's from the heartland for God's sake. He's raised on a fucking farm. I mean, like, how much more American can you be, dude? He's the <laughs> ultimate country boy. You know, I mean, he refers to himself all that. He's like, you know, you're like Batman, you know, he's an urbanite. I'm just a country boy, you know, who happens to be from a different fucking planet. But it's, you know, I, I as a fan of both of these things and in the comics, guys, they're best friends. Bruce Wayne and Clark are pals. Do they agree on everything? No. As a matter of fact, the majority of the time they disagree. Um, when in the most one of the more recent arcs, when uh, Batman actually Bruce Wayne, quote unquote, died, although that didn't really happen. There's a conversation between Superman and Wonder Woman where Clark is always just like, I never thought Bruce really liked me all that much. I figured he just tolerated me. And then Diana has this look on her face of absolute bewilderment. Like She's like, are you serious? She's like, he had nothing but respect for you. He actually looked up to you in certain capacities. You know, He didn't agree with everything on you, but he saw you for what you were as like the, the ultimate good guy, You know that you would always do the right thing. And it's seeing the dichotomy between these two characters because they are so diametrically opposed, um, almost to the point of almost being superhero versus supervillain in, in some weird alternate universe, even though they're both on the same side. You know, Batman is the brains, the, the tactics, the strategy, you know, the guy, the last guy in the world that you want to play chess against. Because when you sit down at the table, he's already going to have you beat. He's going to be 50 moves ahead of you. And Superman is just a force of nature. You know, I mean, he's he's literally bulletproof, bomb proof, you know, everything but kryptonite proof. You know, he's the ultimate tank that you would want on your team when you're facing a supervillain. 
And on top of that, we're getting Wonder Woman, we're getting Aquaman, we're getting The Flash, like all this in small doses leading up to the next movie, the Justice League movie. Guys, I think that's fantastic. And I'm going to have to call out Pat the NES Punk on this one, Pat. Love you guys. Okay, so Pat called Gal Gadot not very he didn't regard her as I'll call exceptionally tall um, because they were giving her a little bit of flack, you know, for playing one. And he's like, I don't think the build is right and stuff like that. Yeah, guys, does she look like a professional bodybuilder? No, she's a woman from Israel. I, I don't think that that's ever going to happen, but not calling her exceptionally tall guys. She's five foot 10. That would make her a supermodel. And they kind of only take exceptionally tall and his take on it, like, you know, Wonder Woman, six foot two and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah. In the comics she is. Cause she's an Amazon. She's not a human. Okay. Well, Superman is supposed to be six foot four and Henry Cavill is only six foot one. So am I that upset? But no guys, come on. We're splitting hairs here. She's not, she's five inches taller than the average woman. Does that make her freakishly tall, you know, above six feet? No. But how many five ten girls do you see walking around who aren't wearing heels in my neck of the woods? Not that many. Well, they don't necessarily have to cast somebody that, that that's that tall. I mean, you know, movie magic, they can... I know. I mean... How Has many anyone seen The Lord Tom, of the Rings, for God's sake? Right. And Tom Cruise <laughs> is in a ton of movies, and he's like... And he's five foot seven. Right. You know, I so mean, it's like, and he doesn't look he, like a midget, you know, compared to... No, he know, doesn't. Anybody and else. I think but. that's the best movie magic ever, is that they make Tom Cruise not look short. Right. Yeah, or Robert Downey Jr., for example. He's five foot seven, too, and he plays Iron Man. In right. your opinion, is 5'10 acceptable for somebody who's playing Wonder Woman? I think so. I think that's, for someone who can act and who's naturally beautiful because all the Amazons are, they're like this super race of godlike beautiful women who are the size of men. I mean, she's eye to eye with Superman in the comic books. Like, she's the only woman, aside from maybe Supergirl, who can stand up to Superman. Like, she could take a direct hit in the face and be like, is that all you got, bitch? You know, I mean, it's... And seeing her doing the bracers and shit, guys, I, I was ecstatic. I mean, like, we haven't seen Wonder Woman, really, since Linda Carter. Right. Since the fucking 70s, man. It's like, come on. How can you not be excited for this? It's it's hard to do Wonder Woman. I'm really excited to see how they pull it off without it, you know, being cheesy. And from what, it, from what it looks like, you know, it's looking like it's going to be pretty sweet so far. And, yeah, I just don't get the people hating on Ben Affleck as Batman. I mean, everything oh he's been in lately, he's been knocking it out of the park. The I, town, Gone Girl, I mean, come on. Has now. everyone forgotten that Ben Affleck's failures are like this and his wins are like this? Right. It's like, guys, he and Matt Damon hold the world record for the youngest people ever to receive the writing Oscar. The first movie he wrote won a fucking Oscar. Holy shit. I mean, like, you know who else did that? Sylvester Stallone for Rocky. Right. And he was almost the same age. He was, I think, was three years older than them. So they basically kicked him out of the record by being the youngest guys ever to win an Oscar. And yeah, The Town, Argo, which he oh, yeah, wrote, Argo. And directed, even... and starred in. Mm -hmm. Guys, it, he's not an idiot. I mean, he's really, they, they're treating him like he's some kind of a hack or something who's only done like piece of shit movies and stuff. Right. I mean, guys, has he done some stinkers? Sure. So but, is Anthony Hopkins. Right. I mean, so is he's, Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> he's so far past Geely and Jersey Girl and yeah. all that shit, you know. And so, I, so he did some pieces of shit. Big deal. He did Daredevil. And, you know, yeah. Daredevil wasn't the, <laughs> the greatest movie. But, you know, yeah. that's in the past now. So, but, you know, like with, with Suicide Squad, you know, I'm going to keep my mind open. You know, we'll see what happens. I'm not going to say you know it's great or not yet but um or it's going to be great but you know Zack snyder the past few comic book movies that he's made you know 300 watchmen man of steel have all been great so i I'm, couldn't agree more i'm gonna trust him on this I, i'm I, gonna trust that he knows what he's doing you know i thought the dude i have watched so many times the flight sequence where he first learns to fly from man of steel on youtube probably a couple of dozen times that I thought was the best example of showing what it would be like for a guy basically learning to master how to fly because it's all in his head. You know, he's basically right. forcing levitation. And if he fails the first time, it's not like, you know, I, I know I'm going to get some hate on this, but, you know, the Christopher Reeve version where he just like flies out of the cave like it's effortless the first time. That's not how it would work. You know, he may have the powers, but 
it's like the fucking matrix. Everyone falls the first time. Yes. Like he's going to fail the first time. That movie was basically him learning what it means to be Superman. He's and not going to get everything right the first time. Cause yeah, he's an alien, but guys, he was raised as a human and we are known for our mistakes. That's what we do best is fuck up. But we also learn to be better than that. So I, I mean, dude, for my money, dude, that was the most human of all the Superman movies that showed that Superman, yes, he's an alien. Yes, he's a god. But as far as who he is, he's one of us. He's a human. He's going to screw things up. And I'm sure he's going to atone for that in this next one. I'm sure Batman wants to tear him an asshole and be like, do you have any idea what you've done? Right. You know, I just want to see, I want to see the exchange between them that has happened before in the comics that I think is the best singular exchange of one conversation between two superheroes when they first meet where Batman's just like, he's like, you can't exist. Like not, no one being should have this kind of power. And the Superman's like, I'm a duly appointed officer of the United Nations. You're an outlaw. <laughs> like, cause it's, that's really the way it is. Like Superman is like the police of the world and Batman just does whatever he wants. Right. So I, I'm, I'm really, I'll close and say, I'm really looking forward to this guys. I'm really excited. And I, I hope it's going to be great. I really hope they get this one. Right. Um, well, that's, Pretty much it. We haven't seen Ant Man yet, but it's getting pretty no. good reviews. So I'm excited I'm to see, see it. Today. it. Uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna go tonight to watch it. So we'll definitely talk about that next week. Absolutely. Um, is there anything else that you can think of? Yes. That you want to um, cover? There's a yes. There's a clip going around the internet um, that I have a few things I'd like to comment on. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it right now, where they ask all these Hollywood types um, basically uh, a nerd question that I think is awesome. Uh, for any of you not in the know, I have a new weekly series that uh, happens on Mondays called Retro Rumble, where I basically do this exact kind of thing that they do in the video. I take two pop culture things, whether it be video games, movies, television, you know, things from the past, and I put them in a room and say, you know, if these two forces had to meet, who would win? You know, we've done the X-Wing versus the R-Wing, you know, um, Jack Burton versus Buckaroo Banzai, like everything. Anything pop culture is fair game. So check it out. Monday's on the Jimbo channel, please. Thank you. Shameless plug. Um, so in this video, they put up two uh, against each other that I'm honestly pissed I didn't think of. <laughs> um, so I got to give them credit for that. Uh, so we have the Millennium Falcon versus the Starship Enterprise. So Opinions aside on this, on who would win, guys, that's not really the point of why we're talking about this. I was honestly amazed because they asked people from all different facets of Hollywood, like actors from Game of Thrones, directors, writers, um, people in big movies, people on television, um, who they thought would win. And Tyler, I think over half, probably maybe 60% of the people they talked to had no fucking idea what either of these two things are. And... <laughs> I was thinking, like, not all, they didn't, they weren't talking to the Miley Cyruses and the Justin Beavers that were, like, these, you know, young, you know, idiots who have way too much money to actually be able to think. We're talking people that are older than Tyler and I, meaning they were around, probably for the first Star Trek, they were around when Star Wars actually came out in theaters. So it's not a generational gap. I'm just amazed that, considering that this is literally what they do for a living, they are in the throes of pop culture. And Star Wars and Star Trek, I don't think is a stretch to say, are two of the most iconic anythings to ever grace pop culture. It's almost like the Coke and Pepsi of movies and television. You know, which one is better? You know, it's that that's probably the original nerd debate. What's better, Star Wars or Star Trek? You know, that was probably the first nerd fight. And these people were clueless. They're like, well, the Money and Falcon. And they're like, okay, why? They're like, I don't know, because it sounds better. I'm like, <laughs> I like the name. What? What the fuck, man? Like, how do you not know what this is? Like, what what kind of rock were you living in? Were you living in the fucking vault tech vault or something? You know, for the last 40 years that you've not, you don't know who Captain Kirk is? You don't know who Han Solo is? That is incredibly unprofessional, considering that this is the industry that you work in. And you don't know what that is. But the dude from Game of Thrones, I forget his name and I'm totally losing nerd card now, the old guy who was hanging out with Stannis Baratheon gave a super cool answer, one of the super cool answers. He was like, oh, the Millennium Falcon, no doubt. And they're like, why? He's like, he's got a better pilot. I was like, he's got a point. Like, <laughs> they do have Han Solo and Chewbacca. And then Adam Savage, the Mythbusters, who 
not surprisingly, gave us an incredibly scientific answer as far as why the Enterprise would win. Because let's remember, folks, he's an engineer. So that's the way he's going to approach this. Like, which, from an engineering perspective, would win? And of course, he picks the Enterprise. And he actually pulled a nerd card and he made a reference to an actual Star Trek episode on The Next Generation where Worf is like, there's some antiquated ship was attacking the Enterprise. And they're like, oh, they're shooting lasers at us <laughs> as if they're throwing rocks. You know, it's like, right. lasers? That's for kids. We have fucking photon torpedoes, for God's sakes. But to go on record as far as who would win, guys, let's cut through the bullshit here. Is the Millennium Falcon awesome? Yes. Is Han Solo awesome? Yes. Is Chewbacca awesome? Yes. Is Star Wars fucking awesome? There is not one bone in my body that will ever disagree with that. Guys, the USS Enterprise... We're talking about a blue whale against a nurse shark as far as size. This is a galaxy-class warship whose singular purpose is to wipe out other enemy ships. That's why it was built. This is the nuclear submarine of space. It has one purpose, to kill other subs. That, that's the whole reason it exists. The Millennium Falcon, it's a smuggler ship. Yes, does it have defenses? Yes. Can it attack? Yes. Did it help take down the Death Star? Yes. In a small kind of way. Yes, it did. But guys, it's not taking on Star Destroyers. I would venture a guess that the Enterprise would probably take out the fucking Death Star. If, you, if it had a clear line of sight and a couple of photon torpedoes, it would probably blow a goddamn hole through it. So it's... Guys, no. The Millennium Falcon holds like 20 or 30 people. The Starship Enterprise is basically a moving city. I mean, it's... And all these people are soldiers, for God's sake. They're professionals. They're not criminals. So, anyways, that's that's my take on it, Tyler. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that the purpose of the Enterprise isn't to kill other ships. In my opinion, it is. It's to go. <laughs> it's to go boldly where no one has gone before. Oh, shut <laughs> up! Oh my God, really? I'm sorry. I had to. <laughs> Come on, dude. It's a freaking. It's an attack ship for God's sake. It's it's the pride of the freaking starship. You know, Federation fleet. You know, this is their flagship, so to speak. Oh yeah. I, now, I'm with you. The the Enterprise would destroy. Yeah. The Millennium Falcon. I mean, <laughs> the Falcon would be, be like, fucking with their hyperdrive. Yeah. You know, the entire time before. <laughs> I mean, they they couldn't even get out of the way, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to cover <laughs> they, their shit would be broken. They're, they're sitting she there getting take the professor and plug him in the back and fix the fucking hyper try. <laughs> and this this the enterprise would just be like, Boop. <laughs> just vaporize it. <laughs> I was I was going to ask you, did you participate in the? huge fucking fail that was amazon prime day did you no, go no, on no. and look i actually wanted to ask you about that no no what happened bring, bring me up uh, to speed it. well amazon prime was supposedly going to have this huge sale that was going to be bigger than black friday and uh about so i was you know going to get on it i thought that'd be a good time to you know check out some games Mm -hmm. And, you know, get them for a decent price because, you know, that's always the great thing to do on Black Friday is all the games, you know, that they put on sale at, like, Best Buy, GameStop, and all that, you can get the same deal on Amazon not have to, you know, wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. But, um, anyways, I I would go on, and it's just the biggest pile of shit that I've ever seen in my life. I mean, <laughs> they have sales on shit that you don't want nor need, and it was yeah. like you're going to a giant garage sale. And I, I take that quote because that was a quote that was used in uh, several articles online that all these people were saying that it was like a giant garage sale. But, I mean, there were no games on sale. Now, I did pick up two scores um, okay. on Amazon got? Prime Day. This was the highlight of the day. Uh, uh oh I got can you, The Wizard. Oh God, that's the highlight. <laughs> that was the highlight of the day, <laughs> and I got, and oh I got the um, game over, which is the um, okay. Okay. Atari uh, them digging up ET in the yeah. desert, um, the documentary that they did on that. So uh, yeah, ET didn't actually get home, guys. ET's buried in the <laughs> desert. That poor bastard. 
<laughs> actually dug him up. He's like, phone on the cloud! Being him with shovels and shit. That was, that was the director's cut. <laughs> but, um... Can you spin that show? Oh my God. <laughs> but anyway, so that was all I picked up on Amazon Prime Day. So it was a pretty big flop. Um, also, uh, I just want to talk about real quick, um, yeah. to let our viewers know, um, uh, the art of video games is is currently in uh, Memphis right now. It's a Smithsonian exhibit um, that is traveling around now to different cities, and I think it's going to be there until um, maybe late August, uh, early September. But I went to check it out, and it's a really really cool exhibit. Um, starts out from the basically the um, beginning of video games. And um, it's really neat. It has um, it's an interactive art exhibit, and you walk through. You start at the beginning, and you can play examples from each era of video games. So um, the first example was Pac Man in the arcade, of course. and uh, you can uh, press buttons on the wall, and you can list. They have about four examples for each system um, of the games and they talk about you know what's going on in the game with the objectives and all that and how that game was revolutionary but um for that system or whatever but you walk through and it goes up until basically like the ps3 wii and 360 and um you know pretty much every video game systems there so you can walk through i think for the ps3 they had like flower um, they had Super Mario where you could play it. And uh, throughout the exhibit, um, they had some really cool uh, original art from like World of Warcraft, like the early sketches from Blizzard. Um, wow. From Fallout, they had the, well, it wasn't original Fallout, but it was Fallout 3. They had some of the original sketches from that game, you know, posted where you could. Uh, you know, look at them, but I wish I could have gotten some pictures of the stuff, but of course there was no photography, but, um, a really cool display, but, um, I really encourage all of you out there to, um, maybe in, in the Memphis area to definitely check that out and, uh, you know, be on the lookout for where it's going to go to next and, you know, check it out in whatever city it's, it's going to be at if you're close to that area. Because it's a really neat display of, um, of you know, our uh, retro culture, you know. And I'm glad that, that it's definitely getting the recognition now that it deserves. And, you know, that video games are actually art. And um, they're getting that respect now, so... I'm, I'm sad that I missed it, guys. I'm in, I'm close to the D.C. metropolitan area, and that's, there's more D.C., there's more D.C., there's more museums here per square mile than probably anywhere on the planet, and uh, I'm no stranger to the Smithsonian. I'm actually kind of pissed that I missed it, but maybe it'll come back around. If it does, I'm definitely not going to miss it a second time, but we'll see. That's epic. But um, I have one more thing I want to mention before we close it out and get out of TV and movies. Um Something I heard about the other day, don't know much about it as it was just announced, but I think it definitely has promise. Um, a lot of you are probably not going to remember this, but anyone who's the age of Tyler and myself probably will. Um, this is kind of a hidden gem from the 80s. Movie way back when called The Last Starfighter, um, which was such a big deal when it came out, actually. I mean, this was like during the hype, you know, the peak of Star Wars and everything like that, where space movies were basically at their crescendo. And um, they're apparently going to reboot this as a television series, <clears throat> which I think actually kind of makes more sense than doing it as a movie because this would be a much longer narrative. Um, you know, just getting to tell the story of basically a kid who's really good at a video game and the video game itself is a recruitment tool for an alien race of starfighter pilots, I guess, whose, whose job is to protect the galaxy. Um, so I think that that's absolutely awesome. But um, they're going to take this one step further, apparently. And for those people who have... Um, Oculus Rift uh, style headsets, there will be portions of the TV show where you can actually hook your Rift, I guess, into your TV or whatnot and look around the scene as it's happening in real time on the show. So it's almost like you're there inside the television show. And I personally think that that's fucking amazing. I think that that's a game changer for 
um, movies, for television, for all this stuff. And at the same time, this is a franchise I actually enjoy. I love the original movie, man. It's very dated, but it's very fun. It's still a really, really cool concept. And, uh, you know, just getting to incorporate something like Oculus Rift with the VR technology um, into this completely different medium where it was originally created for video games and now we're going to incorporate it into television, I think just speaks to the notion of that video games are literally changing media. Not just video game media, but all media. It's changing the way that we see, do, and interact with things, whether it be movies and television. I think that's a really super cool thing, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with this. Kind of loosely associated with that, um, <clears throat> next week, or the week after, I think it's next week, um, mm -hmm. I'm actually going to go to a book signing. Um, a lot of you are familiar with Ernest Klein. He wrote uh, Ready Player One, which definitely um, is relates to what Jimbo was just talking about because in Ready Player One, it's um, pretty much everybody uh, in the book uses what they call uh, an oasis, uh, the Oasis, which is a virtual reality um, system. And mm -hmm. a lot of you that have read the book know it's, it's really a love letter to retro gamers and uh, retro video games. Um, great book. Definitely check it out. But his new book, Armada, just came out. And um, it has a lot of the... Um, it's kind of the same flavor of the last starfighter. So if you like that movie and that, that premise, um, you know, Armada definitely, uh, follows along with that. Um, and it's still in the same vein as, uh, ready player one. I know Will Wheaton from, uh, Star Trek. And of course, um, you know, from YouTube, um, geek and sundry, he does the, um, he does the audio book. So, uh, my buddy picked up the audiobook and said that he um, he did Armada too, and I know a lot of people really liked him as the um, narrator for Ready Player One. But uh, I'm excited to go down there and uh, get him to sign my books and meet the guy. And, um, you know, they're actually working on Ready Player One as a uh, movie right now, and supposedly Spielberg's going to direct it or either produce it. Um, I hope he directs it, but you know that could be a great movie so definitely excited about that um mm -hmm. have you got anything else jimbo you think we haven't covered this week i think we probably talked these people into slumber already but you know what <laughs> i hope everyone who's still listening has honestly had a good time this is completely unrehearsed and our our first and hopefully not last attempt at a podcast so uh, if there's any, if we made any of the typical podcast mistakes, we apologize in advance. We gave this our best. And uh, guys, we will um, be getting up a Twitter account and yep. a uh, Facebook page yep. that we can update y'all on. So be on the lookout for that. We'll probably put links for it in the description below. And definitely check out uh, Jimbo's channel uh, at the Jimbo channel here on YouTube, and of course my channel, Metroid's Prime, uh, here on YouTube. So definitely check those out, and uh, we'll be back next week for another episode. Um, so if there's no further ado, I guess we will uh, end it here. All right, game on, Tyler. All right, game on, Jibbo. <laughs>